My name's Owain and I'm the Education Officer for Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, or ARC. And ARC are a national NGO who are primarily concerned with conservation of our amphibians and of our reptile species, and also the habitats on which they depend. And we do that through a whole manner of different ways. So there is education, there is lobbying, campaigning, and partnership work with other NGOs. So taking that all to, to governmental decisions, local decisions, and there is managing the habitats as well. So managing the habitats to ensure that they're the most suitable they can be for wildlife. And also working with landowners to do the same and specific plans for different species as well. Uh, heathland, or in this case, dry lowland heath is, is the kind that is best for reptiles that has all our six reptile species is characterized by a low-lying shrub sort of uh, area really so heather plants and why it's so good for reptiles is because it has this low-lying shrub layer so it's, it's characterized by this shrub it doesn't have so many uh, so much shading so there's not these huge trees all around which means that that area there's far more suitable basking areas for the reptiles it's warmer on the ground they've got sandy areas they can bask in which are warm as well as well as having that reduction in shade and because heathland itself is is quite rich in, in lots of specific species beyond reptiles gets invertebrates and all sorts it then has a supply of food so it has sort of everything it needs it has its, its shelter space for all the mating and things like that it has uh, areas that can hibernate and it has the food it needs so it has everything it needs in one space which is why you get all six of our reptile species here uh, we have the grass snake which is our longest snake so maybe 1.2 meters would be a big sort of adult individual and uh, that, that species is, is known for being a bit of a, a wetter snake so it prefers the wetter environment. You might find it in ponds and things like that because it feeds on fish, it feeds on amphibians um, and you will find it sometimes laying its, uh, its eggs in, in compost heaps and things like that so that is the largest of our snakes. Uh, we also have the adder, which is our only venomous snake, um, characterised by this zigzag pattern down its back in terms of ID, and it's got vertical pupils as well. Uh, really, really beautiful patterns. Uh, the males have a black zigzag, the females tend to have a, a more of a brown zigzag, and that animal can live in, it lives uh, across the UK, quite a, a northern range of, of a species really for, for a reptile, um, and it, it lives in areas, it lives in moorland, grassland, open, open sort of scrubby forest and heathland, things like that. Um, I did say it's our only venomous species, but it's just absolutely really is nothing to be worried about. You are more likely to be injured by unloading your dishwasher than you are by being bitten by an adder or a snake in this country full stop. So really, uh, it's just a beautiful animal and a joy to see anywhere. And then our third snake, uh, sometimes referred to as the third snake because so few people know about it, is also our rarest snake and perhaps our most enigmatic snake is the, the smooth snake. And that is only found now on this dry lowland heath habitat, this habitat that exists across Surrey, Hampshire and Dorset in these heathlands like the one behind me today. Um, it has been, it once had a much wider range but it's sort of been pushed into to these areas exclusively now and that is uh, characterized so it has unlike the adder it has a to sort of an id feature it has a round shaped pupil um, it doesn't have that zigzag pattern down its back it's uh, about sort of two thirds half a meter two thirds of a meter long half is, is more likely um, and it's a sort of brownish gray color uh, really well sort of camouflaged into drier bits of heather so those are the three snakes uh, we also have three native lizards we have the common lizard, which, uh, as its name suggests, is the one that's quite a bit more widespread and you'll find in various places. We have the slow worm, which is our legless lizard. So it's, uh, it's, lots of people do mistake it for a snake. So it no longer has its external limbs, but it still has remnants of its, of its uh, chest, its sort of shoulder and hip skeleton inside it. Really amazing animal. Um, Quite often that is one that it's a gardener's friend, can be found in gardens if you're lucky if you have them in your garden. Eat slugs and snails and invertebrates. Uh, then we have our third, our rarest lizard, which is the sand lizard, um, which can grow sort of 15, 16 centimetres. As its name suggests, it needs, it needs sand as part of its habitat because the females, they make little egg burrows and they need a sandy substrate to bury those eggs in. 
and the sand lizard is a, a beautiful animal. It has these eye spots running down in terms of a pattern. Really recommend you, you Google and see what they look like. The males have a really striking green vertical, uh, green sides in the breeding season. So uh, it really is a, a beautiful animal. And that's that Sirarius lizard. So six species of reptiles found naturally in the UK and a couple of non-natives that have uh, sort of semi semi-naturalized themselves here as well. We are delighted, always delighted with an interest in reptiles, uh, but we do recommend that, that looking for reptiles is done really sympathetically. So some, if you are, were to go out and look for adders or look for lizards or anything like that, um, and you weren't part of a formal survey, everything is better through a long lens. So we really recommend like, looking at them from a binoculars, standing far enough away or through a camera lens that you can see the animals because you'll also get a much more natural behavior as well. And we actually, if you are a photographer who's looking to take photos of those adders um, for, for whatever reason, we actually have a, a library available as well should people want to, to, to do that. But everything's better from a long lens, except, uh, except if you actually are a part of a formal survey Survey. So we, we work with a number of volunteers, as do lots of our partners, to survey um, four reptiles throughout the year and that's a really nice way to get to see them because we use the data from those surveys to actually inform conservation. So what I'm doing here is this is a bit, a bit degraded but I'm turning over a piece of a sort of roofing material and these roofing materials are put down as artificial refugia and what they do is they're, they're placed around strategically across the landscape and we use them to, to do reptile surveys and what those reptile surveys will be is a few times a year someone who is trained um, and they have a, a training which means they're able to receive a license uh, because you need a license to look for smooth snakes and sand lizards they'll be trained to, to go and do those surveys these surveys will have landowner permission depending on where they are we'll turn them over and we'll look what's underneath and the reason is and i think um, any sort of reptile keepers will be aware of this, it's because these bits of material hold on to that warmth a bit more, more warm up a bit uh, quicker. So they're a good area, particularly in the morning uh, and the evening to turn over because they're that much warmer and they attract the reptiles. So they're more likely for us to find a reptile under them. And that way we can do the counts and the surveys. So one of the great things about managing uh, managing areas of wildlife, managing natural areas for reptiles is that reptiles are an umbrella species. So when you protect a reptile, you cast this shade, you cast this umbrella and you protect a whole series of things underneath them. And that's because reptiles are carnivores. So there's a whole series of animals, a whole, a whole food chain underneath them, different levels, different interactions, right down to plant level. And they're all interrelated. And so effectively, uh, when you look after a snake, when you try and manage an area to conserve a lizard, you're actually doing, doing work to conserve an entire ecosystem. The thing about reptile conservation that, that we find uh, is, 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 is there's quite a lot of misinformation and things like that. So they are, because they're so cryptic, people don't know a lot about, about conserving them. They don't know a lot about their presence here. So actually an interest from a private sector in that way, if, if that interest is channeled into a wider interest in reptiles and in their conservation across their environments, like any, I think, responsible um, pet owner would have those kinds of interests, that's only gonna be beneficial for us because we really, really are always working towards making sure that people value these animals more and making sure people know more about them. So anything, any interaction where that, that kind of thing can happen any kind of ways that that positive energy can be channeled is going to be beneficial for for the reptile conservation if we if we channel it correctly definitely snakes in the heather is a project led by amphibian and reptile conservation to conserve the smooth snake and to conserve the internationally important heathland habitat on which it depends and we're doing that in a number of ways we, there are two main sides of the project. There's a citizen science side of the project. So we're going and training out an army of volunteers to go and survey the areas where the snakes might be so that we can get baseline data and decide uh, and, and look at what's happening to the population. And then the other side to the project is an education and awareness side. So letting people know that it's here, letting people know that the heathland is here and why the heathland is important. And one of the really important things about snakes in the heather is that it's this huge partnership project. So lots of landowners have heath, there's various, there's NGOs, councils, things like that, who have areas of heath, and many of them actually already do reptile surveys, 
but what we're hoping to do throughout this project is get these people in a room together, get us all sharing our data, so we can really see in a national level what's happening, and we can really see how the different people are managing their individual heat and what's happening to the populations there. And then from that, form some best practice guidance to further the conservation of the smooth snake into the future and ensure it survives.